in this first uh, part of my, of my talk, this next hour or so, uh, I'm going to really focus on this question of improving the recognition of women and girls on the autism spectrum. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to start off with what I've, what I've qualified as a very brief introduction to autism. So I totally understand there's a huge amount uh, of expertise in the room here today about autism, and I'm not here to... Uh, hopefully to kind of, you know, retread things you already know. But I think it's important that we have a think about how the definition of autism has changed before we go on to think about how it is currently in front of our eyes changing. I'm then going to talk about the gender ratio in autism, uh, asking this question, is there a diagnostic bias against females? Uh, and then I'm going to think about what I call the female autism phenotype, uh, female-specific characteristics of autism, uh, that, uh, with a particular emphasis on thinking about those that are empirically uh, kind of established, so which reflect scientific studies, and which are important to our thinking about uh, improving recognition of autism, and then have a bit of a think at the end about what's the impact of the female phenotype on diagnosis, and how, what steps might we begin to take to redress uh, this problem in, in current autism practice. Now, before I start, I've taken to putting this slide into all of my talks, I think partly reflecting various sort of roastings that I've suffered on Twitter uh, for using the, the, wrong, the wrong sort of language, but also I think um, to reflect the fact that the voices of autistic people are actually becoming gradually more influential in the way we think about and talk about autism, and obviously that's a good thing. Uh, and certainly in the UK, uh, I'm not sure about in Canada, I suspect it's the same here, there's a debate about how we talk about uh, autism. So I'm a clinical psychologist. When I was trained to talk about people who had a, uh, were using mental health services, we always used person-first language. Yeah? The idea being that you didn't define the person by the condition that they were, be, had been diagnosed with. So if I'd gone to my supervisor and one of my placements says, oh yeah, I've just been with a schizophrenic person, they might well have kicked me off the placement. You know, they would have considered that to be really abhorrent language. Now what's interesting is that within the autism community there's a growing voice for identity first language. And many autistic people now identify as not a person with autism, but um, an autistic person. I think that reflects a couple of things. I think the first is that people who prefer that language are saying autism is not something that's a kind of add-on to me. It's not some optional extra. It's fundamental to who I am. You, know, you can't take the autism away and then I'd be the same person. I'm an autistic person. And I think the other idea is that um, we tend to use person-first language for negatively inflected conditions. So we don't we start to say a person with schizophrenia, a person with depression. We don't say a person with good looks or a person with intelligence. And so I think a lot of autistic people resent the idea that by using person-first language, you're making the assumption that autism is entirely a kind of bad thing that has happened to somebody. And my, my conversion happened. I was out for a walk with a friend of mine who is autistic, um, who said, I'm an autistic person but a person with OCD and generalised anxiety disorder. And I thought that, that kind of clinched it for me. And so I've now you know, tried to use person first, uh, identity first language, although I totally respect that there are different views within the autism community, and, and I think it's important not to be too strict of each other about these things, personally. Uh, and that's an interesting paper, by the way, if you're interested in this idea, where there was a kind of survey done with autistic people, members of the autism community, and this, this topic was explored in, in some more detail. OK, the birth of autism. There's Leo Kanner, uh, the, the German-trained, Baltimore-based psychiatrist, uh, a very eminent child psychiatrist, who uh, had a clinic at Johns Hopkins and noticed certain kids coming through his clinic. Kids like Donald, who, as I understand it, is the first person ever to have been diagnosed with autism. Uh, and Donald was happiest when left alone. Uh, he almost never cried to go with his mother. He made stereotype movements with his fingers. He spun with great pleasure. Uh, he was judged to be literal and inflexible in his use of language, uh, and he completely disregarded the people um, and instantly went for objects. Yeah, this was Kanner's account of, of, of uh, Donald. And he saw a series of children who he considered to share important common features with Donald, and Kanner wrote this famous paper that's the sort of foundation for, for the kind of what so many of us do and, and to, to some of our identities. Uh, and it starts with this rather elegant and memorable line. Since 1938, there have come to our attention a number of children whose condition differs so markedly 
from anything reported so far that each case merits a detailed consideration of its fascinating peculiarities. And he went on over the next few years to say that this, this entity that he believed he'd identified had two core features, uh, which kind of map on to the two core features, the, the autism dyad that we currently have in DSM-5. So one was an inborn autistic disturbance of effective contact, as, as, as they put it, as, as Kanna uh, put it. Um, so what we might think about as kind of social reciprocity difficulties and, so, so difficulties and social communication difficulties. Uh, and one was the kind of non-social features of autism, a powerful desire for sameness. And that foundational account of autism gave rise to a sort of consensus about autism that really took hold in the, for the second half of the 20th century. And I kind of came into the autism uh, world uh, when I got my first research assistant job with, with uh, David Skews at, at Great Ormond Street in 2002. And this view was, I think at that point, in my opinion, we were on the cusp of shifting to a different view. But let me tell you about what I consider to be the, the sort of dominant 20th century view of autism. And then I'm going to go on and say this was actually based on what I'm calling a number of myths about autism that have since been challenged by empirical literature. And so we're going to go on to take a more kind of contemporary account of, of, of how autism is conceptualized, thought about today.